Well, hello everybody! Uh, hi my darlings! It is time for another Facebook Live. Um, I'm hoping you're there because I just tested this out in a different group and the, the feedback wasn't working really well. So this might be very short if we don't get to a Q&A section. It's because I can't see you, but then now, all of a sudden, I can see you all! So I guess it's working fine. Um, hooray for technology! Um, sometimes it's with us and sometimes it's against us. Anywho, um, not a lot planned for today, but I hope it's still fun and interesting. I do have some exciting things to gerbil on about. So, yes, shall we get started on the gerbling? Hello, hello Kate, hello Heather, um, hello Julia, hi everybody! Um, as always, you know what I love the most is hearing where you're dialing in from or tuning in from or whatever because it's just so thrilling to me to know where the eyeballs are coming from all around the globe so um, that's why I do this so that um, so that I can contact people I or like interface with readers who I don't normally get to see because I can't go everywhere when I'm doing signings or a book tour or anything so I hope I'm reaching some of you who, um, yay, Milwaukee, cool! <laughs> right, so, um, for the YouTube folks, let's just jump right into it, shall we? While you guys are all revving up and getting some questions for me on the Facebook. Um, here is the upcoming illustrated edition. Already did a little show and tell with it. Um, but I'm super excited about it, as you can tell I keep talking about it. Uh, one of the things I learned is that this style of binding, where the cover of the hardcover is right on the board, is called case wrap. Isn't that thrilling? So this is a case wrap hardcover. It's my first one like that. Um, I mean, their special edition from Subterranean was case wrap, but it was, you know, a totally different aesthetic. And yes, it has uh, illustrations throughout and it has lots of cute little illustrations at the beginning of chapters and I'm pretty excited about it. I think it's, I think it's really fun. One of the questions I keep getting about it is whether Orbit is planning, this is out of Orbit, my original publisher, and the question is whether Orbit is planning to do the whole series like this and I don't know is the answer but my assumption is if this one sells well and does well I think everybody would be interested in doing another one. Um, I know at least my um, book cover designer said that she'd be definitely into that. So um, fingers crossed and yeah I think everything's gone smoothly. All of my signed tipped in pages have all gone back to the publisher and so all of the first uh, 10,000 of these books are signed by hand by me. Uh, so if you order it or have ordered it or order it early on, you should get a signed edition. Um, 10,000 is a lot of books, so hopefully they're all signed. What else? Uh, this is very exciting. I got this uh, arc to read in the mail recently called Girl Squads. It's a nonfiction book. Um, and it's just like super cute. It's basically um, a bunch of stories about uh, it's 20 female friendships that changed history and um, it's written by a friend of mine Sam Mags and I'm just like super excited about it right now and it's all different like um, ethnicities and, and races and times during history. It's all around the world um, just about female friendship and you know how important that is to me and how excited that makes me and how I want to read more of girl squads in my life. That's kind of my what I'm hunting for right now is books that feature strong female friendships. So I'm super excited to read the nonfiction book on the subject. So that came in the mail for me recently. Um, I think it's actually coming out right around the same time as the Solace Illustrated Edition. So hey, you can pick them both up. Um, so yes, that's called Girl Squads. Ooh. Ah. Dun, dun, dun. Very excited about that. What else is going on? Ooh, while you guys are thinking of questions and hopefully you're thinking of some questions for me, or I can just talk. Um, <laughs> I snuck away on the three-day weekend, um, weekend before last, last weekend, recently, and drove up to Ashland. For those of you who don't know, I live in the Bay Area. Um, I drove up to Ashland to the Shakespeare Festival, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival up there, uh, to watch not Shakespeare, uh, but their queer gender-bending production of Oklahoma. And oh my god, it, it was it was amazing. Um, I cried th three times in 
Oklahoma of all musicals um, like flat out sob cried it's it's just so the the main two characters are a lesbian couple and the um, the comedic secondary two characters are a gay couple and they uh, manage to make Oklahoma without changing anything but some of the pronouns they don't change the words or anything but they manage to make it into this like intense insane fantastic commentary on like possible utopias as well as um, the situation in the world today. Um, there's even sort of like a nod, not nod uh, to, to incel and, 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 but still it is like joyful and wonderful and amazing and magical. And everybody needs <laughs> this production of Oklahoma in their life. This is the, pl the playbill from the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Um, this is the production. Unfortunately, it's, it's ending soon. Um, there it is, Rogers and Hamilton's Oklahoma. That's the main, they're the main, main couple. That's Curly and Lori. Um, it's just a remarkable production. I can't recommend it highly enough. I'm, I'm really hoping somebody got a video of it that maybe they'll put out into the world. This is the kind of show that should go on tour. I wish it would go to New York or to London or whatever. Um, it was truly like a magical and amazing experience. I haven't had that kind of theater experience in a really long time. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I don't have a, a, a strong theater background myself, but I did hang out with all the theater kids. So um, I, I, I love theater. My mom's been dragging me to, to Shakespeare and, and et cetera uh, since I was a wee thing. Uh, I'm sh I swear I've seen Midsummer Night's Dream like a hundred times. Um, so I, I love to go to the theater and, and I love musicals in particular. So to see that done to Oklahoma was like, just truly an amazing experience. So, well worth sneaking off and um, and maybe maybe being a little later on my deadline in order to go see it. Um, yeah, it it was really great. So, does um, anybody have any questions they want to get us started off with? It can be about anything, upcoming books, anything um, that maybe you want to know about future projects or the illustrated edition. I think I've asked, answered most people's questions about that, but I'm happy to answer any other questions you have. Drinking my tea. It's late in the afternoon here in California, so it's a Thai tea. This doesn't have quite as much caffeine as normal for me, so if you're wondering why it's kind of an orange color, <laughs> that's what's going on. <laughs> Let me think what else is happening. Uh, so we just had a question from Amanda, who has the rights to my series? That's a complicated question because rights are subdivided in various different ways, but if you're talking about the original Parasol Protectorate series, Orbit has the rights. Orbit has world rights to that series, uh, which means that they if, they, if the book wants to be, is going to be translated, Orbit is reselling the translation rights to another publishing house in, for example, Germany. Um, and then they have the rights to the audiobook for that series as well, my original series, and to hardcover. Um, generally speaking, if I've sold the book to a traditional publishing house, they have the rights to hardcover, and then they will resell that hardcover rights. That's how we got the subterranean edition of Solace. Um, they don't have the film rights to that series. I held on to those, and that includes merchandising. So those are all mine, <laughs> but um, but they have most of the printing, the printing rights. Um, so we're getting a bunch of questions here. That's why my finger keeps going onto the screen. Uh, maybe I'll try and do it left-handed. Um, Cassandra, it says he's a thespian. Excellent, more thespians. Um, Rosalind wants to know what surprised me while I'm writing SAS 2. Okay, so The Omega Objection is my next uh, new book that's coming out. So Solace Illustrated comes out uh, in a couple weeks. And then in early November, um, the next San Andreas Shifter book comes out. That's the second book in the series, but you can read them independently of each other. And it's called The Omega Objection. What surprised me in writing it? Well, I will say that I had a, a really like excellent time writing the main character. One of the main characters is a bartender and it was just really fun um, writing all of the crazy drinks that shifters would, would drink. <laughs> like, you know, mixing everything with clam juice or if you're a mermaid or whatever. Um, that was fun because I used to be a bartender. And I guess that also surprised me about it because um, I did not enjoy being a bartender at all. It's not, um, it's not my most pleasant job experience, I'll put it that way. And um, like sort of writing it from a fantastical fantasy perspective um, made me 
have sort of an affection for that uh, time period of my life and for that job, which uh, I haven't had before. So like thinking about it in retrospect and imagining, imagining a fantasy life around bartending um, really kind of made me appreciate it more, I guess. Um, and maybe think that, that my experience with that particular job hinged on the situation that I was in at the time and not necessarily the job itself. So I guess that was that was the biggest surprise for me. I don't know um, what kind of publication or release surprises it's going to have for me. Every single time I release a new book, something surprises me because it hasn't released yet. <laughs> but when it does release, I'm sure I'll have um, new and exciting things to share with you guys. Bethany wants to know if there's a hashtag that I'd like people to use if they Instagram coloring the in in illustrations in. Oh, what a good question. Um, I don't know. Perhaps you guys should recommend hashtags. <laughs> um, uh, that's a really good question, like parasol color or something. Um, but it should be catchier than that, shouldn't it? Um, recommend hashtags and we'll come up with one for, um, for if you, so the way the illustrations are designed in the, um, in the book is, um, I specifically asked them if they could to do them with as much white space as possible so that like people could color them in and they're all done without, with a blank on the back. So. Um, yeah, so you can color them in if you like, or you can, you can, you know, Xerox them and then color them in. Um, that, I, I, I asked that the illustrators do that, um, so that it could be kind of like a coloring book if you wanted it to, but I don't know about a hashtag. That's a really good question. Doc wants to know if there's any chance of a movie, TV show, radio drama. Ooh, interesting. Um, so the option lapsed on the first series, the Parasol Protectorate series. So it was under option for quite a while, I think about five years, um, and they eventually couldn't get it moving, they couldn't get it off the ground. Um, they had a really good screenwriter attached, and then um, and then that kind of fell through. So, you know, it's the way things go in Hollywood. Um, and so I have a new film agent right now, and so she's shopping as much as possible. And we'll see if there's any interest. Um, I've said it before and I'll say it again, but it's a really hard sell, my universe. It's so expensive. Um, it's just so much CGI because it has the supernatural element and the steampunk element, CGI computer generated graphics and stuff. Um, and then it's a historical and it's set in period and remote locations and stuff. So it just gets it just is screamingly expensive. And I think um, Hollywood is kind of leery of that right now. Um, but I'm cautiously optimistic. Anything is possible. Um, <laughs> Charity says um, that she saw uh, Crazy Rich Asians and Squeed because of the Merlion. Uh, I might have also Squeed at the Merlion part of that, uh, but yes, that is the Merlion that is represented in Competence. Um, yeah, I too went to see Crazy Rich Asians and I must say I very much enjoyed it. Um, it, it does have, I mean, there's some commentary about the social stratification and the richness of it, which, um, you know, that there's always commentary about that sort of um, um, thing in, when in, represented on screen. Uh, so far as I know, it's, it's, it's relatively accurate to the structure of um, Singaporean society from my limited exposure. Um, but I, I did enjoy the movie very much, partly nostalgically, because I visited Singapore and I, I really had a wonderful time there. So it was lovely to see the city again. Um, yeah, uh, I also highly recommend if you guys have the chance uh, taking a look at To All the Boys I've Loved Before. Um, which just came up on Netflix. Uh, if you're into rom-coms set in high school, it happens to be one of my oeuvre of television shows <laughs> or uh, 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 movies. Uh, to All the Boys I've Loved Before is, is adorable. It's it's a movie, it's on Netflix, um, and yeah. But for some reason, Crazy Rich Asian and To All the Boys keeps getting talked about in the same conversation. So, and, and look at me adding to that conflation. A very good movie. Uh, I loved it. So cute. Katie wants to know if any of my characters ended up looking different in the illustrations than I expected. Well, I, I feel this way about the manga as well, which is the um, interpretation of the way the characters look is very much a stylistic choice on the part of the artist. So, um... So like there you can see very close up, that's Alexia. And so um, 
Jessany has a very, my artist for this book, has a very distinct style that's a, kind of an Edward Gorey-esque style in the way she draws faces um, and in the way she draws bodies. Um, and that might, doesn't necessarily, in fact it rarely does, match up with the way I see characters in my head because I see the characters in my head as like real human people, you know? Um, not as, as graphic illustrations. So the same thing happened with the manga adaptation of Solace, which is I went into that situation knowing that manga is a very specific style of art, so the characters are gonna look big-eyed and cute and very young, but that's the style of manga. So I wasn't, like, perturbed by it. And I had the same experience with, um, with just me. So, like, here, here, there's her, um, you know, Alexia and Ivy. So you can kind of see, um, she has this very specific style. And it's it's hard to say does it look like that in my head when, you know, like, th that's the style of her art. And I'm fine with that. Uh, I'm game for that. Uh, I feel like that's the point of getting, um, of getting an illustrated edition is that you get the artist's interpretation um, of the look. It's not a, it's not a direct realistic interpretation. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, so, yeah, and I've, so, in, in other words, I, I really love it. I think it's great. I think it's a, that gory style married to my words seems very well suited. Emily wants to know if there's a chance that Faith will make an appearance in Reticence. Ooh, what a good question. Um, so far, no. <laughs> but pretty much everyone else makes an appearance in Reticence. There's a very large opening scene, which you've, if you've gotten to the end of competence, you probably know what that large opening sequence is. Um, where kind of there's a little look in, you get a little look in on a lot of characters that you know and love over the years. Um, and I hope it leaves everybody really satisfied. But Faith is not one of them because uh, her book is kind of going on concurrent with that scene. So she's off getting into a fuss with Channing. Um, so they are two of the characters that aren't in that scene. But everyone else is, so don't worry. Or most everyone else is. Sadia, I think that's how it's pronounced. I'm sorry. If I mispronounce anybody's name, please forgive me. I'm a writer and a reader um, and not a speaker. So I'm very uh, bad at pronouncing things. But Sadia wants to know um, if they're going to make a finishing school manga. Oh, wouldn't that be great? Um, no, I don't think that's likely. There's been no interest at all, so sorry. Um, I would be totally open to it. I think a graphic novel adaptation would be awesome. But. Anouk wants to know if there will be more of Biffy and Lyle as a couple. Um, they're definitely in other books, not as central characters, though. So you saw some of them in... How to Marry a Werewolf, and all of the Claw and Courtship books are all werewolf-human relationships um, and interactions for those that series of novellas which starts with How to Marry, and most of those will take place within the London pack. So that whole series you'll, you'll get um, the alpha and beta of the pack in charge and ordering everybody around or gently encouraging them to do what's best for them. So you will see them, you'll see them there, but I have no plans to do another um, book with them as the main characters. But there is, I mean, there's the San Andreas Shifter book, if you need your gay werewolves, they're there for you. I'm, I'm here to provide that. Um, you just have to go to a different series. Doc wants to know if if he got married, if a certain vampire would give him away. Oh, um, maybe if I wanted to make you guys cry. <laughs> Um, looking through more questions. Oh, everybody's talking about booze. That always makes me happy. Sunshine wants to know if you can pre-order. I'm assuming you're asking about whether you can pre-order the Omega Objection, because you can pre-order the, the um, Illustrated Edition. The Omega Objection you can't pre-order yet, because frankly, I'm still trying to iron out the covers. Um, we're almost there on the cover art. Uh, yeah, and then I can do the upload. In fact, You've just reminded me <laughs> that I uh, that I need to do th the the uploading. Um, thanks, guys. This is great. Um, you're just gonna watch Gail write for a second. 
<laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, here we go. Um, upload pre-order. <laughs> Vor Omega. Mm, yeah, uh, I, I think I did actually get the cover art from my, from my, um, from my cover art designer. I think I have it finally. So yeah, uh, which will, which means that, um, You'll either get a special announcement soon, yeah, with the cover art reveal, or it'll definitely be in the next Cheerup, because of course the Cheerup always gets this stuff first, so it'll probably be a special announcement. Oh, I'm gonna make a note of that too. Um, special announcement. With cover art. Hey, look for that in your inbox. Um, and that, at that juncture, you'll also get the pre-order button, because hey, that's how I think. Do it all at once. As in case you can't tell, I'm a little discombobulated at the moment because I just finished the mainstay edits for the Omega and sent that off to my beta readers. Um, Omega objection, uh, which should tell you that I'm running slightly late on that book. Don't worry, it's still going to release at the beginning of November. I'm just pushing it faster to production than I normally would. Um, but I want to get it out to you in November. Um, it's a promise. Uh, but that also means that I have a couple things on standby. So, um, I have reticence still on standby, which I need to climb back into. And then I have the short story that's due that's on standby. So I, I gotta do that revisions on that one and send that off to my betas. Um, I'm overworking my betas at the end of this year and, um, my beta readers, not beta werewolves. So they can do that if they want to. Um, so yeah. And, and then I had this like weird seminar that I went to yesterday for co for, um, Rakuten, which is Kobo. Kobo is an ebook uh, provider. Uh, so I went to this like strange seminar yesterday, which was full of corporate culture and very strange, very, very weird. I, I have never, I've worked in cubicle, but I've never been to like a corporate expo, drink the Kool-Aid kind of thing, full of business doublespeak and people in suits, lots of people in suits. It's been a long time since I've seen that many people in suits. It was, it was odd. Um, I kept thinking about how much fun it would be to write that as like a demon inculcation thing. <laughs> like, like have the demons be putting on this corporate seminar where they're like, okay, everybody, we're going to learn how to do a proper salt circle. Now you can use Himalayan sea salt. Or you... Um, that's how my mind works when I'm surrounded by, uh, corporate conferences. <laughs> so that was my day yesterday, which has me a little confused by life. Robert wants to know if I would ever set a book in Asia, China, Japan, ooh, with their rich histories of tea. Um, yes, I would. Ha. <laughs> ooh, somebody has come up with the at, the hashtag, which is color solvers <laughs> for coloring in the Parasolvers book. <laughs> um, lots of people, lots of chats going on. Natalie wants to know where Biffy is from. So Biffy is English, uh, at least that's how what I intended him to sound, quite upper class crusty in English, but um, he's described as being possibly Spanish in, in, in back history, like possibly a, a father or grandfather is from overseas, uh, from outside of England, uh, which contributes to his coloring. Um, but it's never gone into in any great detail. Um, and I haven't decided whether I need that information yet. And so I'll reveal it if I need it, if I need to. I've learned the hard way not to lock myself into anything. Um, and then Natalie, your comment goes on a bit longer, but I actually can't, I can't see any more than like three lines on my screen. So I don't know if there's another question wrapped up in there, but if there is, please ask it again. Um, Kate says she's looking forward to seeing me at TeslaCon. I'm super excited about TeslaCon. All you Midwesterners who feel like I'm making the drive, I will be in TeslaCon. I'm also going to be at DemiCon next year, which is in Des Moines. So yeah, hitting up the Midwest a couple of times, or at least the middle of the states. Um, TeslaCon is great. It's a really fun, immersive steampunk event, if you're thinking about it. It's, it's a total blast. This will be my second time. I was there years and years and years ago. Um, but I do love returning to an event because I kind of know exactly what to expect. Um, and we're going to have a tea party with lots of nummy nummy crumpets and things. Um, and then I'm going to do a bunch of panels and I will, because it's TeslaCon and I know everyone and I have friends there and it's the steampunk community, you'll just see me hanging out and chatting all over the place. So it's a really, it's going to be a really fun event. 
Natalie wants to know if my series would be great a uh, good cartoon and I, I think yes so especially the finishing school books would translate to film best animated if you ask me um, but nobody's asking me <laughs> and um, so far nobody's really interested either oh shoot um, Julie is agreeing with me that To All the Boys I Loved Before was great. Um, yeah, I might have to do a rewatch of it already. I just saw it like last week, but I really, really loved it. Um, people are excited by the idea of Solus being turned into an anime. That would be great too. I would be totally behind that. Um, when people asked me first off when Solus was being shopped and got picked up for option, I was asked like what I, what, um, uh, companies, film companies, they wanted pitched, and I was like, Studio Ghibli is like the top of my list. But of course, you know, now it's kind of does, it's now a different beast. But I would be totally into an animation. Um, I I don't cut any avenues off. I I really like seeing my stuff interpreted in different ways. Um, I would be totally into an audio drama or you know a staged kind of drama, a full cast that kind of thing. Um, but for the Parasol Protectorate, Orbit has the audio rights as well, so they would have to be interested or, or somebody would have to approach them to do that kind of an adaptation. Um, so, and so far as my kind of independent and self-published works are concerned, like um, like the San Andreas Shifters or uh, the novellas in terms of audio dramas, um, A, I would have to do the adaptation and I'm not that into it, and B, it's just too expensive to produce on my own, so um, it has to be taken on by somebody else. Do, do, do. But I'm open to it. Always open to that kind of thing. I really love people being new and innovative and experimental with my words. I think it's really fun to see how they go out into the world and transform into something else. Tisha wants to know if I'll be doing a series with Sophronia between the Finishing School and the Parasol Protectorate. So there's the Delightfully Deadly series. The Delightfully Deadly series follows the girls from finishing school out in the world doing their what they do. So in other words, they follow the trained girls as they're out being spies and assassins. The first one is Poison or Protect, and that's a precious book. Um, and then there will be more. I'm just writing them. Um, I intend to give Dimity a book and Agatha a book and uh, even possibly um, Felix and... Um, Pillover, like there are lots of fun characters to write books for from the finishing school and I would really like to explore them and show them using their skills out in the world um, between the time period of the finishing school books and the Parasol Protector books. So we're talking the 1860s. They, I have no plans for Sophronia to be a main character for many, many reasons. The first one is she already got four books, you guys. <laughs> That's enough. Uh, the second one is there's an etiquette issue in using main characters that have already been highlighted for a traditionally published book um, series in an independent series. It's not that I can't do it, it's just that I won't for political reasons, so for politeness's sake. Um, so there's a business reason also not to have Sophronia be a main character again, as part from the fact that I'm uh, done with her. We're done. Um, I'm when I end a series, it's ended. <laughs> I like to say uh, I messed around in that character's head and in her life long enough. Um, she should go off without me. That said, I have a super special project coming up next year for um, the 10th anniversary of Solace. Can you believe it? 10 years. Um, and that special project has a significant, if very short, scene that features Sophronia and Soap in action. So you will get to see them. Um, it is told from Soap's point of view, not Sophronia's. And I will tell you more in the cheerup. The cheerup will get all of that first. So that's the newsletter for you. You guys will get to know before anybody else. And I can't really talk about it now because the story isn't finished. It needs to be finished. I don't like to make promises when I haven't actually completed the document. Um, and literally, I just signed the contract for it. So um, I'm going to wait until I've been given the official go-ahead to make the announcement proper, and then you'll know a little bit more. So you do get Soap and Sophronia as side characters and background characters, and you'll get a little look in on them, but not as main point of view characters. I have no intention of doing that. Um, although, I always say, and I never rule anything out. Um, 
there's a whole part of my creative brain, most of it I'm really good at controlling, but there's a whole little bit of it at the back here that will occasionally wake me up in the middle of the night with something I have to write, and I have to let that do what it wants to do. So anything's possible, but I have no intent of doing um, any Sophronia main stories again. Sorry. Do do do. Um, Beth wants to know if my teacup is an antique. Yes, yes, it is in fact an antique. Um, I am one of those people who collects antiques and then uses them and sits in them and writes on them. <laughs> so I have an antique uh, desk. Um, if you look at some of my YouTube videos, there's a tour of the office. You'll see some of my antiques there. But um, and then there's also a tour of my teacup collection. But yeah, I like oh, so long as they're not um, dangerous in terms of like a leaded glaze or something. Like that. You you won't see me drinking out of um out of an all metallic tea cup, for example, because they an antique one can be can be dangerous. Um, but yeah, I think um, tea tastes better out of porcelain. It's probably a lie, but I think it's true. I like to pretend it's true. Doc wants to know if there's any chance of an American storyline in America. So originally I had intended for Reticence, the fourth Custer Protocol book, to actually have a significant portion that takes place in the United States. But it didn't work out that way. We immediately flew off somewhere else. So that didn't happen. Um, I'm not against it, but so far I haven't I haven't planned anything. Um, maybe I'll send one of the delightfully deadly girls over there. Uh, one of the one of the Mademoiselle, Mademoiselle Geraldine's trained assassins will have to go to New York or something. That might be fun. Um, yeah, I'm not against it, but I, I haven't planned anything at the moment. Victoria says she wants these glasses, my glasses. These are a gift. Uh, it's possible that the person who gave me these glasses is watching this live right now. Um, they're a gift from a reader. And yeah, they're awesome. I just took them, they're vintage, and I just took them in and had them put my prescription in. Yay! So I can read what you guys are typing on the screen. Um, Natalie has ideas about what should happen. Um, I'm not going to read them in case I'm actually, I've already written them. So yay! <laughs> um, so you guys can go read what Natalie's ideas, but um, not not to me. Uh, it's like fanfic. I, I can't read them in case in case I've actually already written the thing that you want me to write. Because I'm pretty good at sensing what you guys want. <laughs> After 10 years, I should be, right? Beth says she wants her top fan badge like every other person there. Write some more comments. That might get it. I don't know. So Facebook, for those of you who aren't familiar or don't do Facebook, um, watching later, Facebook is doing this thing now where it gives little badges to people who interact with pages a lot. So I'm a page. I'm doing this on my Facebook page. And you get a little badge that says top fan or, or conversation starter, stuff like that. Um, and apparently all the people commenting on the live have top fan badges except for Beth. I'm sorry, Beth. I don't know how Facebook makes this judgment call, but I will call you a top fan if you like. Robert says, any hints about the cover art for Omega? It's really good. So I, um, it's following the same theme as the Sumage solution. So it's the, it's a silhouette and then with a, um, a character in it. And it's Isaac is the, the bartender character is the character who's inside the wolf and he's super cute. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm really, and then it has a different, so the, the Max is inside the wolf on the Sumage solution. He has a fracture pattern over it. And then I have a different, I have a different treatment pattern to, to the, to kind of illustrate the drama of what's going on in the story. Um, but soon, soon it will be released. Um, and, and I am following the color scheme for this series. So um, right now, it's at least for the pack, it's intended to be a three book series. And so I'm following the like standard Gale color theme for, for those three books. So, which means you can probably guess what colors are incorporated in the cover for the second book. Um, Stein wants to know if Ivy will be in the next Custard Protocol book. Oh, ha, huh, that is a bit of a spoiler. Um, but yes, yeah, you'll go to, Ivy gets a look in. Um, yeah, it's fun. It's fun to revisit Ivy. Uh, 
Uh, Doc says that they like Kobo, but Amazon is so much easier. I know, that's the problem. Amazon is easy, and therefore people who are lazy, like me, um, we end up with Amazon. Robert wants to know if I would do a book with witches and magic, like straight up magic. Well, the Sumage Solution series, the San Andreas Shifters, have mages, or pseudo-mages. They're called Magistars, and they use a, um, a substance in the world called quintessence. Um, in order to perform magical acts, but it's a very sort of restricted kind of magic. I would definitely consider and write um, sorcery, like a full-on magical system. I think that would be really, really fun. In fact, the project that I'm pitching for a new young adult series um, involves a fully developed magical world system, and it's not the Parasolverse, it's a completely different universe, um, where the main characters are, are magic wielders of, of varying kinds. So, um, so that might be what's next up for me. We'll see. Uh, I have, I, it's on the long list of things that I am late on and delayed on and really need to be writing. The pitch for that series is one of them. So, uh, you know, I just have a bunch of dominoes stacked up right now and I need to tip so that I can start like the process. Um, so definitely I would consider it. I would, I would love to do it. In case you guys hadn't guessed, one of the things I love is world building. Um, it's really a joy for me. I have a really good time creating very complex interwoven universes. Um, so yeah, I'd love to do more of that. Just wait till you read my sci-fi. Oof. Um, Arasim is talking about the short story. So the short story is a secret project that is going to be releasing next year. And if you want more information about that short story, you need to belong to my newsletter, The Cheer Up. Uh, that's where I'll be talking about it. Eventually, when it comes out into the world, I will be announcing it. But all of the hints and secrets and stuff behind that short story are, uh, are going out to the newsletter. So that's how you learn. Oh, sorry. Left hand. Whew, everything has to be done left-handed. Uh, Beth wanted to know uh, if I'd already talked about what I was drinking, what cup I was using. And yes, I'm almost done with it, but I don't mind repeating. Uh, it's an antique cup. I don't know when from. Um, and it's unmarked, so probably American. Um, could be a revival. Could be the 60s or something. Um, and I was drinking a Thai tea with milk. Um, not a sweet tea, but uh, which I think is a salon-based, maybe. Uh, not a very strong black, uh, which, you know, it's a little late in the afternoon for anything super strong. Hey, Clinton! Oh, my goodness! Old friends showing up. Do I think that Lord A ever worries that one of his... Oh, <laughs> do you think Lorde ever worries that one of his romantic drones is the son, grands, grandson, etc. of a past romantic drone? Um, knowing Lord Akuldama, um, he would probably find that, like, weirdly kinky and exciting, because uh, he can get that way. Um, oh, Katie's very excited to see me in Des Moines. Yay! Um, and so is Charity. Demicon. Yes, Demicon. It is official. Um, hilariously, one of the organizers of Demicon came up to me at Worldcon last month and was like, so you're our guest of honor next year. And I basically was like, I am? And I could not remember anything about it. I was like, I agreed to go to Des Moines for a, a con? And I basically texted my assistant. I was like, Kelly, what's going on? She's like, oh yeah. Um, but I agreed to do it in... January of this year, and because my brain is really civ-like these days, had completely forgotten about it because it was such a long way away. It was like a year and a half away. And so I was like, okay, well, I've got a million events to get through before I go there. But yes, I agreed to do it. And yes, they agreed to my writer, which I have a writer that basically is like, make sure you have a sexual harassment policy posted. And like, here are the things that, you know, if you want me to come, I would like you to do. Um, so far as I know, I'm coming, um, barring, I know, major illness and accident. So yeah, I will be a Demicon in Des Moines in May? May, I think it is. May of next year. Clinton is excited that his email, yes. So those of you who have ordered from Borderlands, I think they have their stock for the illustrated edition of Solus. Um, so they're starting to ship out and stuff already. Uh, there isn't a stop sale on it. So Sorry, that was a uh, uh, publication speak. So 
um, sometimes with a new book, like a new book that people are really anticipating, like the next Harry Potter book or something, um, there's something like a, a stop, a, an SOS, a strict on sale, which means that the bookstores cannot ship or put that book out on the shelves, even if they have it, until the actual date. Um, you know, so that everybody gets it at exactly the same time. And the bookstores can be fined pretty heftily if they violate that. But Solus, of course, has been out for years, so the Illustrated Edition doesn't have a strict stop sale on it. So uh, some bookstores are already shipping it out to people and everything, because it's, it's out in the world. Obviously it's out in the world, because I got my copies. So, um, yeah. Uh, but again, uh, some places are going to be slower than others because of distribution channels and it depends on where you are in the world and all that kind of thing. But I suspect like Borderlands, for example, as soon as they get them, we'll start shipping them out to people because um, you guys were great and ordered a lot from them and they will try to satisfy and, and make sure you get it as soon as as soon as possible. Lois is excited. Uh, are you going to be going back to TeslaCon? Because then I will see you there this year. Alec wants to know who I would cast in a Solus TV series. It's really hard to think about that now because I played the casting about um, 10 years ago when the book first came out. I played the casting game. Like, I can tell you some of the, the people in my head when I was thinking about, like, Alexia. So, um, but... I, I would say they're all probably too old now because I'm old and so that's how I think about people. Um, but like uh, Claudia Black was one of the actresses that I always thought would make a good Alexia um, from Farscape. And then um, Gina Bellman is another one who I think is um, visually kind of, and she's leverage among other things. Uh, Coupling is the British TV show that she was in. Um, so I definitely have actresses that I would love to see as Alexia. Um, and then, of course, I always uh, cast, um, I mean, Jared Butler is who people think of for Lord Macan. Um, but, you know, I could see Richard Armitage. There's a bunch of other, other actors I could see in that role. <laughs> people are tuning in and out, um, and Pamela has just amusingly said, I missed a bit because the toddler jacked the phone for a baby shark. I don't know what that means, but it sounds very exciting. Oh, and uh, people are being very helpful. I love it when you guys help each other out in the comments. That makes it a lot easier for me on the back end. But yes, um, if you are confused about the pre-order for Soul is Illustrated and you're trying to get it on Amazon, for example, um, you need to tunnel into the different editions. So, um, you know, you'll see the book image and then next to it it'll say, you know, audiobook, ebook, or Kindle edition, and blah, 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 blah. And one of those is a hardcover, and that's the Solus Illustrated. When you click on it, this cover will come up, so you'll know you have the right edition. Um, and that's how you know which edition it is. Um, Stephanie wants to know if we will get a book of with Lord Akaldama as the main character. I think, Stephanie, you were also the one who asked about Sophronia, so I'm going to be disappointing you. Um, <laughs> I always say that uh, definitely not a book. Um, I always used to say no to that question just because the idea of spending any length of time in Lord Akaldama's head is utterly exhausting for me. There's a reason he's a side character, which is he's a lot of work emotionally um, just to deal with. Uh, and then someone else recommended that I write something where the where Lord Akaldama's cat is the POV character telling the story, and I find that hilarious. So maybe I'll do that someday. Maybe a short story. Um, I can't imag imagine a whole book. Um, I could imagine doing snippets of shorts or I could maybe a novella um, with multiple POVs, but it's never like I've never had any inspiration for that. So often the way I come up with writing short stories or novellas or passion projects is I wait until I see the two characters who are going to feature in the book interacting with each other in some sort of very clear scene in my head. And it's not always the opening scene. Sometimes it's a later scene in the book. But until I have that kind of epiphany moment of clarity, I don't write it. Um, 
once I have that epiphany moment, then I can kind of come up with the story structure and I write my outline and I get going, but I need to have that moment. Um, and that's never happened for me with Lord Akeldama. In other words, he's never kind of sung in my head and said, hey, I have a story to tell. And, and it, there does need to be a plot or a story. So until he does that, or a side character does that, or his cat does that, um, he's always, he's kind of on the back burner. And that's kind of how I am with, with a lot of, um, with a lot of the passion projects and the novellas that I'm writing. Um, so a couple of them have, and then I take furious notes and they're just wet, waiting in the sidelines. So I do, I'm not like not writing them because I don't have ideas for anything. Like I do have ideas for upcoming novellas. So like I have my idea for the next Delightfully Deadly novella. Um, but I tend not to talk about exactly what that is with you guys because I'm never sure when it's going to release and I don't want to get your hopes up. So I only really start talking about a project when I've actually started writing it because then I know I'm going to finish it because I do finish things. Um, and then I feel like I'm, I'm so, then I'm more comfortable talking about it. So I do have a bunch of ideas for more stories in the Parasol verse with other characters that you know and love, but, and I have had moments of clarity and moments of epiphany for those books, but I haven't actually started writing them yet. Um, and that's just because I am the kind of author that I would get easily distracted by shiny new ideas and I'd never finish anything because I'd be like, oh, that would be fun to write. And then I'd go start something and then I'd be like, oh, that would be fun to write. And then I'd go start something else and I'd never finish the first one. So the way I get around that as an author is I just m take like furious and extensive notes on the one epiphany scene that I'm envisioning and then a few shorter notes on like what the outline will be and where the plot's going to go. And then that kind of quiets my psyche or my muse. And then I can sit, sit that and I have an ideas file and it just sits there. And then I can come back to it when I'm ready to start writing, actually writing the book. And until I come back to it, I don't really like to talk about it. Um, so yeah, that was a very long answer for the Lord Akeldama. So what I can say with the Lord Akeldama is I've never been hit by a moment of inspiration for him. But that's not to say it's not, not gonna happen, but it hasn't happened yet. So he's not in the docket. Um, there is no twinkle in the ethereal eye for, for him to have his own story. Pamela says he always makes himself the main character when he appears, which is very, very true. And one of the things I've learned over the years with Lord Akeldama is that he's actually an instrument for narrator. He's an instrument for my psyche. He often has sort of very inf Im important information to impart or knowledge about the general structure of the whole universe or um, the future of where the characters are going to go because he is this kind of all-knowing super spy character. Um, and I, I tend to use him like that uh, as an author from an authorial perspective. Um, he's, an, he's an interjection of narrator voice often when he comes in, which is why he kind of takes over a little bit because it's almost like it's me taking over from myself in a very strange way when Lord Akeldama is on the screen. So... Um, Doc has an idea with Lord Akeldama as a young indie series going through different periods of history and stuff. And I actually um, have a, an idea to do Alessandro as that kind of a character. Um, I really, I have some loose notes for Alessandro uh, throughout different points of, his, of his, his timeline. And I think it would be really fun to write those out as sort of disjointed journal entries and, and that sort of thing. Um, but he is also, he has a sad ending um, and that's very challenging for me to write. I'm not that kind of author. I tend to, to like to write happy endings, obviously. So um, I kind of, I'm str sort of just struggling even thinking about that book, but maybe someday I'll be at a place where I can, I can do that. I'm sorry, I'm looking through your lovely, lovely comments. Um, Sarah wants to know if the video crashed. I don't think so. I'm, everything's looking pretty seamless. My end, there's no lag or anything. So it might be your, um, app or it might be, um, your internet connection. Um, Beth says cream goes last. Gasp. Uh, I know I'm, um, trained by my very plebeian mother into, um, putting the milk in first and then pouring the tea in second. Ah, which some people find quite shocking. Scrolling through, scrolling through, tra 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 la la. Um, Doc is making insulting statements about tea. We'll ignore that. Everybody's talking about badges. Oh, the, the fan badges. Yeah, who knows what's going on. 
if you make Gail clap, you should get a badge. <laughs> How would Facebook even process that algorithm? <laughs> That's very funny. Um, Alex lights my lipstick. Thank you very much. Can I just say um, uh, colors day for the win? This is Maybelline. I uh, I wear myself some cheap colors day lipstick that lasts forever. This stuff went on at 7:30 this morning, and it is now. Oh, what time is it? It's now 4:50. Oh my gosh! Stop asking questions, everybody. Um, it's rush time. The last 10 minutes of the show, and I will try and get through as many of your questions as I possibly can. So everybody, stop asking them. Um, do 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 do. This is Gail makes aimless humming while she looks through questions. Um, Katie's excited to see Ivy again. Everybody's always excited to see Ivy. What hat will she be wearing? That is the question. Man, I have to make sure I put her in a hat, don't I? Um, I probably did, but ooh, I'll just make a note of that too. Um, there's a lot of Gail making notes in this episode, but then again, you are doing a live with an author. Hooray! Um, Rosalind wants to know um, if Rue has to visit Hollow Heart Aunties before said big event in Reticence. And you're just going to have to wait in this juncture for Reticence. I know it seems like it's yonks and yonks away, but don't you worry. I got you covered. Everybody you want to see, pretty much, you're going to get to see. And, um, and it's hilarious. Um, <laughs> Andy says they're only on the third Book of Ivy. <laughs> <laughs> the Book of Ivy. <laughs> Don't worry, there's more Ivy to come. Uh, my favorite Ivy is in the last book of the Parasol Protectorate series where they, they take the troop to Egypt. Um, that's my favorite Ivy. And there's the stage performances in that book. <laughs> uh, Ivy and Tuzdal and the Bumblebee scene will live in infamy. Um, it's one of my favorite scenes I've ever written, I think. Oh, people are saying nice things about my world building. That's very, very, very sweet. Um, Robert wants to know if I write better in different seasons. Absolutely. Um, I don't know. It's okay. Here is the secret about being an author is a lot of authors wait for like the inspirational time. Like they wait to be mu like moved by the muse. I call that the fugue state. Um, and those are the authors I think who struggle the most. They wait to be inspired to write. Whereas if you want to be a full-time professional author, you need to like, it has to be a job and you have to sit down and you have to squeeze the words out and you have to write. And that's the hard part, at least for me. Um, but the great secret, of course, is that if you go back and reread the books uh, that you've just written or you're rereading your manuscript, um, the times when you were inspired and the times when you were like working your little butt off to get the words onto the page are completely like, you can't tell the difference. Um, like the words are the same. They're, it's your first draft, so the words are all crap and you're going to have to fix all of it, even the inspirational parts. So that's kind of like the, the, the secret to being an author is, is like at the end, um, the point is just to get the book written. Um, and so it's, it's all pretty crappy. So I don't know if I write, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm teasing with the word better here. I don't know if I necessarily write better or worse in different seasons, but it's definitely the case that it's easier for me to write in some seasons rather than others. So, um, I tend to write best during cold, rainy, dark times of year. Um, because I just feel really like cozy and comfortable and I'm at home and it's I don't feel like I should go outside because it's a beautiful day because I could just be inside and write. It's like the same kind of weather that's best for reading for me is the weather that's best for writing, which is um, cold weather where you can have like maybe a little fire going or, or something um, and, and just sit and write. That's my favorite time. Um, I think, you know, my genetic heritage is um, Northern European. And so, you know, I think I'm kind of just inclined for dark, gloomy weather all the time. You know, it's extremely pale, pale skin. I'm meant to be indoors while it's raining outside. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my best. Um, and I think Robert is also asking about any habits that I have. Um, if you're asking about sort of general writing habits, um, I tend to be an afternoon writer. That's when I write best, um, kind of tea time-ish. So I, I tend to do most, the bulk of my writing when I'm, when I'm working on a rough draft is done from about two to six in the evening. 
Um, and then I'm also a very competitive social writer, so I really enjoy writing with other writers, um, even if we're just all sitting around a table silently typing away. I'm the kind of person who will look up and be like, how many words have you done? And if they've done more words than I have, I like, have to keep typing. Um, yeah, tiny little competitive person <laughs> hidden. So I actually do really well, and I'm, I'm very productive on writing retreats um, and you know, that and uh, writing meetups and write-ins, you know, during NaNoWriMo and stuff that that's, those are really good for me as a writer. And I know it's very different for other writers. They're definitely write, I have writer friends who can only write in like a perfectly solitary, perfectly quiet environment. Whereas you'll often find me at a local coffee house, because even if there's no other writers there, just the ambient noise and activity um, kind of keeps me motivated and keeps me typing. Um, Arasim is asking a question that, uh, I am not going to answer in a very cagey way. Um, spoiler, 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 spoiler. Doc wants to know about a sci-fi series about what the parasol world would be like in the 22nd century. How do you know the Tinkered Stars isn't that? I've never told you it isn't. Um, the Tinkered Stars, for those of you who don't know, uh, has Crud Rat in it, in that universe. This is my sci-fi world. It has Crud Rat, which is a full cast audio drama, and it has my upcoming book, uh, The Fifth Gender, which I'm, I guess that's what we're calling it. Um, I keep waiting to be hit by a different title, but I think that that title has stuck at this juncture. That's, that's my next book out in the spring of 2019, and it's lovely. It's my current, like, passion project. I love that book. So, um, that's sci-fi. That's The Tinkered Stars, uh, and it could, it is possible that that's the future of the Parasol Verse. I'm not ruling it out. Beth wants to know about um, those of you who ordered Solace with the personalization from, from Borderlands. So if you ordered the Solace Illustrated Edition and you ask for it to be personalized by moi, um, Jude hasn't contacted me yet about that. I will ping her again. Um, for how many? Uh, oh, oh, I know what's going on. Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, I'm doing a launch party. So I'm having a little gathering. If anybody's local to the Bay Area, we're going to do a little Solace Illustrated Edition a launch party on Sunday, I think. Uh, either the Sunday right before it comes out or the Sunday right after. And at that juncture, I'll do all of the personalizations and then Jude will mail them out. So you guys might, it might be a little later before you get it. Um, but that that's how you get it personalized. Uh, Generally speaking, if you want me to personalize it, it just takes a little bit longer because I have to motivate to go and get into the city and sign everything. But I do personalize it. So for those of you who wanted it um, and who ordered it from Borderlands, make sure you say whether you want me to personalize it to you by name or, or anything else uh, because I will go in and do that for you. And you will get it and it will be exciting. Uh, Pamela says I can't possibly be old, which is very kind. Um, Katie wants to know how old Connell was when he was turned. Mm, I can't remember. I feel like I said he was in his early 30s or something, but mm, that could be wrong. Um, people are excited by the idea of Richard Armitage. Ooh, and we only have a couple more minutes, um, so I might not get to everybody's questions, uh, but I will definitely try. Um... Doc says that there needs to be an anthology. Uh, man, I really did try uh, to get an anthology up and running, you guys, for those of you who didn't know that that was going on in the background, but it seems like that's not going to happen. Um, but I might try again someday. Uh, I would love to get an anthology going within the Parasolverse where I invite other authors to kind of write in that universe. Uh, but right now the infrastructure just isn't in place so far as uh, independently publishing it because I'm a big fan, obviously, of paying the author and you can't subdivide out easily for royalties. Um, and until the mechanisms for that are put into place, either with a system like Bundle Rabbit or somebody like Amazon allowing for royalty share, I really, I'm not comfortable doing it myself, but it is definitely something on the back burner that I would love to do, um, is just have awesome other authors write in my universe. I feel like it's a great sandbox. It'd be really, really fun to do. But at the moment, uh, n we shopped that idea to publishing houses and nobody was interested in it. So it'll have to be an independent project at some point, and I'd like to do that, but until the infrastructure is in place, I really can't. Just too much. I mean, I could, but it's just too much time. I just don't have that kind of time right now. Do-do-do. I'm just 
uh, checking through. Everybody should go and look at any comments they made that had questions that are, were like um, questions that I might have answered elsewhere because it looks like people are answering each other's questions in the comment feed. Um, so hooray for that. Um, people are talking about completionist issues. I will say that it is pretty endemic among, amongst authors that, um, that they're perfectionists. We are perfectionists. And so you can get in the habit as an artist or as an author of like just working over the first part of a project or the first couple of chapters and never finishing it. And that is a really bad loop to get into and forcing yourself to break that loop and actually finish a project is the biggest step to becoming a professional artist, if you ask me. Um, and my technique for that is I don't allow myself to reread anything I've written, um, except whatever words I wrote the day before just to get the voice back. So I can never back edit until I've finished the entire manuscript, which is one of the reasons my rough drafts are so crappy. Otherwise I would, in fact, just keep rereading and editing the first chapter. Never end. Um, okay, uh, I think we're gonna wrap this up soon. Oh, Beth wants to know where I get my turbans. Beth, you can bop over to Retro Rack and I have links to the exact turbans I'm wearing. So most of them come from Amazon, but um, yeah, I love me a turban, as you can tell. Then I don't have to fuss with my hair. I can just pop a little turban on. It's like the, uh, the vintage beanie world. <laughs> um, Stephanie wants to know how much say I get in the different cover art designs. Um, so I had quite a bit of say in the illustrated edition. So what we did with the illustrated edition, and this is a great thing to end on actually, as ostensibly that's what we were going to be talking about today. But what I did with the illustrated editions is I had final approval on every single illustration that's in here. So they sent it to me and I basically said, could you like move that and, you know, tinker with that a little bit. I didn't have a lot of of changes because uh, I again I like to see it as the artist's interpretation of my words but I did have say so they sent me this for approval so I had quite a bit of influence over these covers um, and so far as my other covers are concerned what I'll say and you know this is perhaps a longer discussion for a different live but I will say that I have more um, influence over my cover art than almost every other author I know and that has to do with the fact that very early on um, with Solus, the very first book, um, I had unprecedented influence on that cover because I was within the steampunk community and I actually found the image that they ended up using, that photograph of Donna, um, who's a friend of mine, because I was in and out of the steampunk world and so I kind of knew the aesthetic um, more than Orbit did and Orbit was fortunately my publishing house. They were smart enough to be like, oh, we're not quite sure what the steampunk thing is, so could you just send us pictures? And, and I did and so um, and that cover was was really very popular and it did really well and it won a lot of um, cover art design awards and stuff. Um, although, you know, the typography and the layout and everything, that was all them. Uh, but it does mean that, that they have asked me to okay and take a look at covers, all of my series and all of my books and cover models and stuff. Um, but I also will say that I'm very judicious about that power and I really only ask for a change in cover if there's something I really object to. Um, but the other way, reason I have a, a formed an, an intimate relationship with my uh, cover art designers is that I also like to put what they're wearing, what my characters are wearing, into the book. So if they let me see the cover early enough, I can actually write a little scene about that cover or feature that cover inside the book. So um, that's why they involve me also. Um, so partly I'm not too demanding, uh, partly I have street cred in that I established myself as an author with an eye for cover art early on, um, and partly um, because they know that I, I like to put it into the book. So they like to show me the, like the colors that they've chosen so I can have them, my, I can write about my characters wearing those outfits. Um, but it is very, 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 very unusual for an author to have that much say in their book covers. And if you are an author and you are traditionally published, please don't think that you're gonna get any say in your cover because you're likely to be disappointed. Um, and part of me agrees with that and part of me doesn't agree with that. But the part of me that agrees with that says, look at what most authors, for example, wear for public appearances. Um, authors don't necessarily have a good eye for what works marketing wise for a cover um, and a cover is a marketing um, 
it is an advertisement for the book. It, it doesn't necessarily need to be a scene in the book. It doesn't necessarily be perfectly accurate to what's inside that book. It needs to be a signal marker for the type of book. It needs to tell the right reader that this is the right book for them, and that's its job. Um, and a lot of authors, I think, are too intimately and emotionally re re like involved with their words, and so they actually aren't the best people for, for, um, for picking their covers. Don't, don't tell my author friends that I said that. <laughs> Says the author who has some influence over her covers. Oh. Um, Laura wants to know if we get a new short story with Lady McCon in a growing room. Maybe. Uh, possibly someday you might get that. Um, Katie says that she trusts me implicitly and she knows that I, I, I do have, I have your, your, um, I have your wishes and hopes and dreams at heart when I write for you. So, uh, hopefully I will give you what you want, even if you thought that it isn't what you needed. Um, or something like that. <laughs> I'll give you what you need, even if you think it's not what you want. How's that? L like, Look at How to Marry a Werewolf, everybody. Like, everybody had... A lot of people were deeply suspicious of Channing as a main character, but I think I managed it. <laughs> I'm pretty confident. Um, people seem to really love that book. So trust me, I got your back. Um, or I got your characters. I got them coming. Um, I think it'll... I think it'll be... I think you'll be happy with what's coming down the pipeline. Um, I, I hope you will. And yeah, Reticence is going to be awesome as soon as I get back to it. Um, yes, so we've got the Solace Illustration Illustrated Edition. I'm wrapping up now, guys. Solace Illustrated Edition is coming in a couple of weeks. Check that out if you're interested in a collector's item. Um, go see Oklahoma if you're anywhere near Ashland. It's the most amazing production of a musical I've ever seen in my life, and I've seen a lot of musicals. I talked about Girl Squads. If you guys read nonfiction, check that one out. I think it's a great little book. Um, I'll talk about more uh, as I'm reading it. I'm sure you'll see me on the Twitters or whatever chatting about it. And yes, I have TeslaCon coming up in November. I hope I'll see some of you there. I have uh, the Omega Objection coming out. I'll be doing another live in conjunction with that. So get your questions ready about the San Andreas shifters. And I have the fifth gender book coming out in the spring of next year. So you got a couple books coming down the pipeline. And hopefully soon I will know more about Reticence and when that release date is next year. And hopefully I'll have other news and exciting things to announce. If you want updates faster than these lives can give them to you, you should definitely be on the newsletter. And I love you guys. And I will see you next time I do a live.